Harry, we know that today it seems that the battle is intensifying. And do we know what's going on? Did Ukrainians reach the defensive lines of Russians? Uh, no, uh, they have. Uh, they're still outside of that first uh, defensive line. Uh, Ukraine's under enormous pressure from the West uh, to get something done and to do it fast. And so they're becoming ever more desperate, uh, throwing their uh, troops and, and, and tanks and vehicles against a pretty solid uh, Russian defense. And they're being, they really, they're being slaughtered is about the best way to describe it. Uh, ample video footage on the Telegram channels of columns of uh, armored vehicles just being blown up one after the other. And uh, so you know that there are Ukrainian soldiers inside those. So the casualties are mounting. And the, the, the Ukraine's problem is it does not have a large enough force concentrated in one area backed up with artillery, and combat aircraft to be able to make much of a dent in the Russian defensive line. So uh, it's, it's going to be this continued, uh, it's not even a stalemate. It's going to be a slaughter and a continued attrition of the Ukrainian army. We know that the, the king of battle is artillery. Yeah. How yeah. much you have artillery, you, you have the upper hand. And do, do you think that Ukrainians have enough artillery to continue this battle? No, well, they, they have enough to kill civilians, but they don't have enough to change the situation on the battlefield. And they've been running out of artillery shells, as well as actual artillery pieces. Uh, the Russian drone attacks have been very consistent, and they hunt them down and blow them up. Uh, which is why Joe Biden felt compelled to uh, give cluster munitions to Ukraine, simply because the United States no longer had sufficient conventional 155 millimeter artillery shells in its uh, uh, warehouses. We heard that they're sending the tanks to Poland to fix them. Because <clears throat> it seems that it doesn't go that that good because because it, it takes too much time to, to fix and get back to the battle. Right. Is, is that possible to fix those tanks inside Ukraine? Uh, apparently not, uh, because if they're, if they're going to be prepared at any one facility, the Russians have the capacity to blow it up. And so that uh, the Ukrainians know that the R Russian intelligence a service is going to identify that location and then it becomes a prime target. So they're just, uh, you know, what, what this highlights is that the lack of a strong logistics tail. And what I mean by tail is the ability to get vehicles repaired, to provide spare parts, to move fuel forward, to move ammunition forward, uh, to keep the troops well supplied. Ukraine's struggling across the board. So, uh, they have the, the, the force to do a trade-off. They're trying to limit the size of the forces being uh, assembled in one particular area because if they do that, then they are a right target for attack. So they keep them dispersed. And by keeping them dispersed, they're therefore weaker in terms of their combat punch. So it's, you know, they're just, they're, they're, there is no good solution for Ukraine. The, the good solution would be that Ukraine had uh, uh, air support that outnumbered the Russians, that its air defense systems outmatched the Russians, that its mobile artillery outmatched the Russians. If they had all of that, then they would be in a position where Russia would be at the disadvantage. But that's not the case. It's the exact opposite. The other thing that is important is manpower. We know that right. they're, they're running out of manpower. Those trained army how do we know how much how much fighter they have right now? Something like thirty five thousand, something like that. Well, the, the they said that they were training a total of twelve brigades for this offensive, and that was back in March. Uh, a brigade has about five thousand people, so it, this we're talking as many as sixty thousand troops at the outset of this. It's, it's estimated 
so far based upon Russian numbers that close to 30,000 have been killed or wounded. That's 50% of that force. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible number. So the Ukraine is in really, uh, I call it a death spiral right now because they do not have the ability to recruit enough uh, military age men, ages 18 to 30, uh, and then put them in a training program that would last 18 months. Normally, you the soldiers need about 18 months of training to be fully, you know, fairly proficient to carry out combat missions, combat operations. Ukraine doesn't have that luxury of time. So they're grabbing guys, getting them and giving them a uniform, handing them a, a rifle, and then with three or four weeks of some orientation, they're then launched off to the front where they end up being cannon fodder. They're usually they're survival rate is very, very low. The other thing that is important in this battle is that their tactics. It seems that Germans who who are so conservative <clears throat> in criticizing Ukrainians, they were talking that Ukrainians are splitting these brigades in small units mm-hmm. and tiny units. That's that's a disaster for, for their counteroffensive. How do you see this? Well, it's sort of amusing that you're getting all of this great military advice from countries that have not fought a war like Ukraine is fighting since the end of World War II. So neither the Germans, the Americans, or the Brits have any experience with what the Ukrainians are fighting. Yet they are pretending to have the knowledge and experience uh, to properly teach them. And what we're seeing is the emergence of a new message, basically blaming Ukraine for the loss, that the West is not going to accept any responsibility for it. This is all because Ukraine didn't listen to the Western experts. Ukraine didn't follow tactics suggested by the West. Uh, the, the Ukrainians did not stick to the battle plan drawn up by the West because the West, according to them, uh, John Kirby just the other day, the national security uh, spokesman for, for Biden, noted, we've given them everything. We, we, we couldn't have been better. There's not a thing that Ukraine lacks, you know, they they need. We've given it all, and it's up to Ukraine to figure out how to use it. Well, you know, he's lying, number one. Uh, They have not, quote, given Ukraine everything that Ukraine needs. Uh, And even if they gave it, uh, it's not clear that it's going to change any outcome of the battle anyway. So there's lots of denials still. We learned from Russians that the the production of ammunition in Russia uh, has increased by by 12 times since this war started. And is U.S. is the U.S. capable of producing that much of ammunition at the same level at, at the same level and price that Russia is producing right now? No, no, absolutely not. The, the industrial capability of the United States has been severely degraded. A lot of it's been sent overseas. So as a standard of comparison, during World War II, starting from January of 1942 until May of 1945, uh, Russia and the United States each produced the same, roughly the same number of tanks. Um, It was on the order of like 45,000, I believe. So... Back then, the United States had an industrial capability equal to that of Russia's. It's no longer the case. Russia uh, is a a giant compared to the United States. And and I think I've commented on this with you before, that when I look back at my hometown in the Kansas City, Missouri area, uh, when I grew up and left high school 50 years ago, uh, there were two automobile manufacturing plants. Uh, from General Motors. Uh, there was a steel plant that was owned originally called Sheffield Steel, then Armco Steel. Standard Oil had a refinery. Bendix Corporation was making aviation parts. And Alice Chalmers was making farm harvesters and such. Those are all gone. Just in, in my, my, that one community alone, they disappeared. Jobs went with it. But, with, but along with that, those factories disappearing, 
the ability of the United States to actually make something and do so in a timely fashion is gone. It's shocking, but that's uh, the United States is hoping it can ramp up production to, uh, you know, maybe uh, 20,000 a month, 25,000 a month. And, you, you know, that's, that's what Ukraine shoots in a, in a week, week and a half. So the United States is not going to be able to match what Russia is doing now. Uh, it, it would take, it's going to take years and, and perhaps it'll never get done. Trump recently criticized Biden for two things. He said that he sent all this ammunition to Ukraine, which is a threat to to this to the U.S. security. And 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 after that, he's saying that we, we are running out of ammunition. How how what's your take on what Trump was saying about Biden? Well, it's <clears throat> it's a fair criticism, but I think Trump also has a little bit of a. Uh, delusional view of the U.S. military. He's, his stump speech, he always insists that the U.S. military is the most powerful in the world. That's simply not the case. It's the most expensive. We've said that before, but it's not the most powerful. Um, what this war in Ukraine, which was entirely avoidable, it was uh, Russia made it clear what it wanted, the removal of uh, the missile platforms that were installed in Romania and Poland. We could carry a nuclear uh, tip missile to Russia. Uh, Putin wanted those gone and wanted a firm commitment that Ukraine was not going to become part of NATO. Uh, totally rejected by Biden. So th this is now a de facto struggle between NATO and Russia. And it is in, it's in the course of this that NATO is being actually demilitarized. Its ability, its weapon systems are being exhausted. It doesn't have uh, deep supplies, so it's it's on a very thin thin leg already, and it just a uh, the, the weak leg that's not going to be able to carry all the weight uh, in the event that there was a real war. It just would not be able to stand up and uh, and provide the necessary troops and material. It's it's basically been poured down the rat hole in Ukraine. It seems that Europeans are looking for some sort of off ramps mm -hmm. in, in, in this in this fight, but it doesn't seem that Biden administration is on the same page with them. Do you think that Europeans <clears throat> are able to convince the Biden administration to bring down these tensions that's going on on the on the battlefield and maybe have a negotiating table? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think. We've already seen in the past Victoria Newland, who is just now appointed as the number two person in the U.S. Department of State, continues to wield enormous influence in the government. And when you think about it, uh, all the top officials, Blinken, Newland, uh, in the State Department, they're all sort of beholden to uh, Hillary Clinton, as was Jake Sullivan, uh, the national, so called national security advisor of Biden. So uh, they're sort of dug in deep that uh, they're going to stick to with Ukraine to the bitter end. But it is clear that there are uh, emerging uh, unease among the NATO uh, members in Europe. And I think uh, you're going to see a growing pressure in places like Germany and France uh, to start disengaging and, and to move away from uh, supporting Ukraine. Wall Street Journal reported that sanctions are not working and Russia can, can sell mm -hmm. its oil over the price cap. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we know that Europeans are really hurting from these sanctions because the car production in Europe from 2022 to 2023, it has a drastic reduction of 36%. That's, mm -hmm. that's huge for the yeah. European economy. Yeah. Yeah, but, particular, particularly in Germany with uh, the Mercedes and the Volkswagen factories and Audis. Why they cannot pressure Biden administration to make some negotiations between Ukrainian and Russians? What are, are European that weak? Yeah, no, no, the, look at the, uh, the number of troops 
that are provided by the various armies, by the French, by the Germans, by the Brits. Uh, last time I checked, I think all three, those three armies combined are not as big as the Ukrainian army was at the outset of the special military operation. So uh, what, what Europe is looking at is they're ultimately dependent upon Washington. And therefore, they have little negotiating room. They either have to stand up and uh, be seen as a pariah and be shut out by the United States, or they continue to play along. It's 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 an interesting dynamic. I I think the pressure to separate from the U.S. policy is going to grow as we move into September and October. You remember that last week we talked about these cluster bombs. That mm-hmm. the Biden administration said that Ukrainians are using these <clears throat> bombs in an acceptable manner, and we know that they they bomb they use these cluster munitions to to hit journalists in in, in mm-hmm. Russia. Does the Biden administration even care about how they're using these cluster munitions? No, not at all. They don't care at all. In fact, it also there was a cluster bomb. Uh, from the United States that hit a, another civilian target uh, in Russia uh, just uh, oh, you know today. Um, so, um, you know, despite the promises that the, this was not going to happen, it is happening. You know that the, the cathedral in, in Odessa was hit by, by missiles and nobody knows, but Zelensky is, is calling on Russia. He says that Russian did it. Is, is, is that possible that Russia do such a thing? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, when that report first came out, it was then on, on some of the Telegram channels, they highlighted the fact that a Ukrainian source made changes to the Wikipedia page about that church, noting that it was being attacked with a Russian missile. But they made that claim 30 minutes before the attack happened. So in other words, they were predicting what was going on because it was, it was a Ukrainian operation. Uh, Ukraine has been attacking the, the, Ether, the Eastern Orthodox Ukrainian church, which has close ties with, uh, with the Russian uh, bishops. Uh, they've been at war with them over the last now 18 months. So it's not surprising at all. They, they'll blame Russia, but it was you know, Ukraine. Larry, the other things that I think is so important for Europe, because Europe is the middle of this mess, because there we have these neo Nazis in Ukraine, we have those far right Russians. If you have some somebody like Denis Kapustin, is a Russian, mm-hmm. it, it's a Nazi, it, it's he's from Russia, but he's fighting together with Ukrainians. He's fighting Russians right now. He has a group called Russian Volunteer Corps. There, mm-hmm. And we know that the and and we know that the Pentagon watchdog reported that some of the weapons sent to Ukraine last year were were stolen, and nobody knows where these weapons go, and who's who's gonna, who's going to buy them. How do you see this this threat that is happening inside Europe? Well, corruption has been endemic to Ukraine and to the Ukrainian military. And we've known for over a year now that uh, much of the weapon uh, supplies from the United States and the rest of NATO are making their way onto the black markets and winding up in places like Africa and Asia, uh, South America. So there was a video showing one of the uh, drug cartel members in Mexico walking around with a uh, one of the, uh, I think it was a surface there, missile or an anti-tank, uh, anti-tank guided missile. But, you know, there's clearly it's gotten outside of Ukraine. So just the failure to implement controls, the failure of any competent um, command structure is making the, those kinds of abuses, uh, you know, very possible. You know, it's just to remind, here's the, the, the odd thing is Ukraine, Ranked number four in the world in terms of natural resources, yet it's the poorest country in Europe. Uh, how can that be? 
How can a country that rich be that poor? And it's the answer is the corruption. Terry, with all that said, yes. what, what would emerge from the situation that is happening in Ukraine oh. with all these neo-Nazis with, with pouring weapons? Let's 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 assume that this this war ends someday. This war this war gonna end. Yeah. yeah. But what's what what would happen to Ukraine? I well, the war ends. It's most likely going to end because Russia defeated Ukraine and defeated NATO. Um, I think one of the first casualties out of this will be NATO itself. Uh, it'll be dramatically weakened, if not uh, forced to collapse, just as people will abandon it. They no longer will want to be part of it because it'll be has proven to be ineffective. Um, Russia is going to face the challenge of having to install a government in Ukraine that is going to be friendly to Russia and will resist these uh, Bandera pressures. And yet there's a whole generation of children and young adults that have been inculcated with this Bandera theology and, 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 and vision of how the world should be. And it's very much in accordance with what the, not, the Nazis uh, espoused during the reign of uh, Adolf Hitler. Larry, we know that CIA director William Burns was promoted, was he became a member of cabinet. And yeah. how do you see the transformation of this guy from that, from the version 2008, when he said he was ambassador to, to Russia, he said that, that entry of Ukraine in, in NATO is <coughs> the brightest late red line. Yeah. And now he's totally in line with the rhetoric of the Biden administration. It's, it's sad to see somebody sell their soul to the devil that way. Uh, you know, he was, he was very accurate and very much right with what he wrote in uh, 2008. He correctly noted what Russia's reaction would be. And that cable, has, it stands the test of time. It's still relevant and it reflects what Russia actually did. Um, so now, but, you know, I, I never understood this notion of making him a cabinet member. Just so it's an honorific title. That's all. Yeah. If, if nothing else, it actually generates now more confusion within the intelligence community, because in theory, the director of national intelligence, who is part of the cabinet, is now is supposed to be in senior to or in charge of the CIA. Uh, but now they've Biden has created, you know, if, if Burns has actually been appointed to the cabinet, it puts him on par with uh, the director of national intelligence. So it's... Uh, it's, it's a mess. We know that during JFK, there was two sides debating each other on, on the policies, for the, on the foreign policies. And mm -hmm. they, they had differences. They were debating each other. And right now, we have all on the same line and the same... Mm -hmm. sim, this, they're, 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 they're taking a very straight line together Right. How, how how do you see this? What's what has happened to those <clears throat> arguments? Well, I was on uh, I was on Iranian television yesterday, press TV, uh, and I had an opportunity to actually debate uh, the uh, a Ukrainian representative that is uh, an organization based in the United States. And you know what? That's the first time. In, in the last 18 months that I've actually seen a debate between opposing sides on Ukraine. Uh, what, what, what you've had in the United States is just a lopsided uh, propaganda that only, uh, the, the, only those who espouse the administration position that uh, will talk about Ukraine is winning, Russia is losing, Putin is bad, uh, you, you poor morale in the Russian soldiers, uh, the economy in Russia is on the verge of collapse, you know, on and on. Never a chance to bring anybody on to rebut some of the things that are being said that are just abjectly untrue. So that that lack of competitive voices 
is dangerous. And that's what, you know, it's, it's leading the West, in my view, to uh, commit a form of suicide with what it's doing uh, towards Russia. It is now in destroying the very international system that the United States cobbled together in the aftermath of World War II and that made the United States the preeminent power in the world. The, the, the role of the U.S. is going to diminish here going forward, not, uh, not improve. Trump said that he'll not give up the fight for the U.S. presidency, even if he's found guilty. Do you think do you think he's got, they're going to be able to to not letting him be part of this race? Uh, no, I think I think he'll be able to continue in the race. But this is, you know, this is the kind of stuff that totalitarian regimes used to do. Uh, that we saw it in the Soviet Union uh, under the Politburo, uh, saw it in Nazi Germany. Uh, you know, this kind of thing, you know, even Fidel Castro would do it in, in Cuba. You persecute and prosecute your political opponents and uh, in, in an unfair, illegal way. So it, it's, you know, we've lived to see the United States become a, a veritable banana republic. Uh, it is it's behaving in ways unbecoming to a great nation. The other the other candidate that is so interesting for me is RFK Jr. Is mm -hmm. he's the? It seems that Democratic Party started hitting him so hard that they don't want him to to, to be part of this this presidential race. And they called him anti-Semitic, something like this. But why, why, why they're attacking him if they if they're thinking that he's not he has no chance in this race? Well, that's why they're attacking him because he is a very he's a he's a threat, a dangerous threat to Biden, and uh, he's not willing to play ball with the big pharmaceutical companies and with the defense contractors that have all grown gotten very wealthy uh, under the Biden uh, presidency. So he, he, he's seen as a threat to the status quo. But it seems to me that Biden is not able to, to continue to, to be the, no, the, the denomination of the Democratic Party this, the way he seems like now. It, he, it yeah, doesn't work. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't function. <clears throat> how, how do, why is, what, why do, why, do you think that he's going to be the, the, the denomination of the Democratic Party? No, no, I don't. I don't, think he, I don't think he'll make it to next year intact. Uh, he's already continued to, the deterioration mentally is dramatic, significant. It gets worse with each passing week. You know, this is, if you, you're probably too young to remember the pictures from the Soviet Union in the 1970s, the late 1970s, when you had uh, Andrei Goromiko, Leonid Brezhnev, uh, Yuri Andropov, all of these guys that fought in World War II constituted the political leadership of the Soviet Union. And it looked like an escape from a senior citizen's home. There was just all these advanced, really elderly people. But guess what? That's what the United States now looks like. You know, with Joe Biden, uh, 80, Nancy Pelosi, 82. Uh, you got Mitch McConnell. I don't know if you saw that uh, event the other day where he, it was freezing he had a, a, a seizure. Yeah, he had a seizure, maybe a trans, uh, what they call a TIA, uh, so a trans ischemic accident. I believe it's that's what it stands for. So you know he's he's eighty. Uh, so you got these very very old people as the government leaders, uh, and you got only a few youngsters, you know, like Kevin McCarthy, uh, but. You know, the United States is frozen in a, it's like a time capsule opened and we've been transported back to the Soviet Union in the 1970s, only now it's America. If, and America is being led by very old and capable people. Larry, if not Biden, do you think they're going to bring in somebody like Newsom? Like, oh, like oh, Newsom from yeah, California. Yeah, Gavin Newsom of Gavin California. Newsom. There's all sorts of speculation. Newsom would certainly like it, but Newsom doesn't appear to have, be that popular around the country. 
particularly given some of his, you know, hypocritical policies and draconian policies that have been imposed out in California. So it's not clear that he's got that kind of vote. Others speculate it could be Michelle Obama. Well, what it highlights is there is confusion and doubt about uh, Biden being able to make it to another term. And there is no consensus yet on who would be the ideal alternative. Kamala Harris certainly is uh, not that person. Uh, She widely disliked. She was not functioning as a vice president. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, you know. With all that said, do you think that the the next president of the U.S. is going to be a Republican or a Democrat? Uh, I, I, if it's if it was a fair election with people with ballot without mail in ballots, the Republicans would win hands down. Uh, but I'm not convinced that. Uh, the Democrats are going to go away quietly. They're they're prepared to lie, cheat, and steal as they did in, in the last two elections. Thank you so much, Larry. It, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. I appreciate the opportunity, and thank you for being so gracious. Thank you.